Good afternoon, and welcome to Pincus Co. Live, the fast-paced weekly New York City real estate broadcast. Today, we will focus on new development. Our guests are Jeremy Schell, a principal with one of the city's most active developers, TF Cornerstone. The firm has a high profile commercial project in the planning phases next to Grand Central that includes 2.1 million square feet of office space. And the firm was just issued permits for a two tower residential complex in Long Island City with 812 units, among other developments in various stages. Shell joined the firm 12 years ago and heads acquisitions and new development financing. Uh, Bob is a veteran real estate broker and co-founder of Massey Knackle for years ranked as the city's most active firm by number of buildings sold. He's a recognized leader in new development brokerage and at JLL serves as the chairman of New York Investment Sales. Uh, I'm Adam Pincus, founder of the three-year-old media and data publishing company, Pincus Co Media. We send out free newsletters on transactions and new development, which are populated using our proprietary data, such as lists of true owners, 421A property owners, info, and more. Uh, I'd like to first uh, begin with Jeremy. Uh, from a developer's perspective, uh, can you talk about where the city's land market is? Sure. Um, I, I think it sort of depends on the asset class and the submarket. But what I could talk to you specifically about uh, is my perspective on the multifamily market. I think right now, um, you know, it's a very much a story of uh, those sites that are that have qualified for 421A under the current regime, which is that real estate tax uh, and set benefit that you'd get by building multifamily housing with affordable housing. And those that haven't, uh, I, I think the market right now uh, is, is more or less stalled because if you haven't planned and pulled permits and are ready to vest by the expiration of the current 421A, which is in this June, you can't rely on a program being there thereafter and therefore how could you buy land so i think you know we've been out of the market for to buy residential land for a little while now because of that uncertainty uh, on the office side you know we're building a large office building or planning a, to build a, a large office building at 175 park avenue here in manhattan right at grand central and i think for those type of main and main uh large scale office development sites, uh, there's probably a very strong market for that kind of land. That said, those are extraordinarily uh, unique and, uh, you know, doesn't apply more broadly. So, um, one of the things I wanted to if you could kind of dive a little bit more into 421A and sort of where you think that is in the process, what the likelihood of some kind of replacement is. Yeah, sure. Um, personally, I, so as I said, the uh, current program is set to expire in June. Uh, the governor's proposed uh, uh, something in the budget that um, is going to now get, you know, I'm sure um, negotiated and uh, vetted by the legislature, and I, but personally just hearing where things are, I, I think the, the odds of what's been proposed passing and being adopted at the end of the day is 50-50 is at best. Um, but I think what we need to understand is what's been proposed is a much worse uh, in terms of uh, fewer financial incentives uh, to, to the development uh, than what, what's been in place historically with 421A. So in, from my perspective, it's a, a much worse program. Uh, and therefore, without a doubt, even if it did get passed, fewer units would get produced than what has been getting produced historically. Furthermore, if the proposal does not get passed and we have no 421A after June, I think there will be essentially no Multi multi-family mixed income housing production in New York City until something then gets uh, reintroduced. And that will take a long time because the, the construction pipeline uh, is, it, it takes years. So there's, there's product in development, it's gonna take three years for that to play out. And then you're first going to see the impact of, uh, of a failure to sort of pass uh, a, a practical 421A type program. 
And so that's three years out. But once we get to that point, there should be a cliff where nothing gets built uh, uh, in the multifamily uh, mixed income uh, category. Do you, are, are there, people talk about the danger of, uh, or there in the past, people have been like uh, industry, uh, sort of essentially the industry has had concerns when there have been changes such as the, the 2019 law. And um, there's the same kind of talk right now that if, uh, if it's not passed, these, all these things are not gonna happen. Do you have examples to show that like sometimes actually things don't get built? Well, I can tell you um, when things don't get built. Well, here's what I, I think the, the proof is in the numbers, right? It, it's pretty simple. Housing finance in New York City is pretty straightforward. The problem is not that 421A um, isn't flawed in, in, in some respect, it, it, but you really have to look at the root cause. The tax regime, the whole, the, the whole uh, real estate tax uh, prog program in New York City is broken. I mean, one third of all gross revenue at a, at a multifamily building would go towards real estate taxes. One third, right off the top if not for a 421A type program. So after the one third of the revenues get stripped, you have to pay a significant amount to operate the building, operating expenses, and then a significant amount of money to cover debt service that you need in order to build the building. There's not enough money at the end of those massive, massive uh, costs to provide any, let alone a reasonable, uh, return on equity. It's as simple as that. It, it, no one's going to be able to build because the math just simply doesn't even come close. Do you, well, are, are you changing your plans because of, or have you changed your plans because of the 421A, the, the, the risks, or as you perceive the yeah. risks? Well, I mean, my plans going forward, I mean, like I said, we've been out of the market to buy land for a, a while now, knowing that there's a great uncertainty on 421A uh, after this June. So we've certainly been pulling back on that. Plans that we have uh, to move forward uh, on entitlements and development, uh, we've, we've been very focused on making sure that we're not dependent on a program like 421A being in existence after uh, June. So we have, uh, we've, we've pulled out of um, getting a project rezoned or upzoned uh, because we didn't want any delays uh, that might uh, preclude us from getting our footings in and investing under the existing 421A. Uh, we were also facing a lot of pol political resistance and that was another reason we just could not move forward um, with that risk also. So, I mean, we've definitely changed our plans on what we've built. We've also changed or thought about so, how we're going to, to go ahead. Sorry to interrupt, but to be clear, you're, you're building a smaller building with yep. less affordable housing because yep. that was That's the change. exactly right. We, okay. we would have probably added, you know, somewhere between uh, 700 to 1,000 additional units of housing. A percentage of those would have been affordable housing. If the politician that was a local councilman would have been someone we could have worked with, meaning someone who wasn't going to obstruct development uh, or, or pull the rug out from under us at the end of the day, uh, it's a long and expensive process to go through a rezoning and you have to rely on a reasonable counterpart. That, that politician is no longer in office, but we couldn't take the risk that we'd get to the process only to have uh, a problem at the end. Also, we couldn't take the risk that it was going to be delayed and therefore we couldn't get footings in the ground and vest under the current 421A. So yes, smaller project, less affordable housing. And that's one example. And, and Bob, I'd like to ask you um, kind of a starting at the a broad, broad question. Um, can you talk about what the, the land market is like right now in New York City? In sure. Manhattan? Absolutely, Adam. And I apologize for being late. Some technical difficulties. You know, technology and I don't get along. I that frequently. was our fault. <laughs> so <thank laughs> no, you no, no worries. I was trying to take the heat for you, Adam. And you, oh. <laughs> you threw yourself under the bus. Thanks for that. Um, land market in the city has changed very dramatically. Talk about a roller coaster ride. I think that when COVID kicked in in March of 2020, 
we saw land values in Manhattan down by plus or minus 50% uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, there was a window of six to nine months where everybody was looking just at doing rental projects. Uh, that window quickly closed. Uh, folks got back to doing, looking at condo execution um, in April, uh, early to mid April of 2021, the market changed based on first quarter reports, robust activity in, in condo sales, upward pressure on rents. Um, we saw private equity get back into the game. Values have been going up. The land deals that we did in Manhattan in, uh, in 2020 were mainly in the low 300s. We got uh, up into the high 300s. Last year, the deals were in the 400s, approaching 500, depending on the site. So the, the traction in the land market has gotten a lot better. Uh, the volume of sales in land in Manhattan last year was, was only about $600 million, which is down 93% from the peak in 2015. But it's coming back. There's momentum. A lot of developers are coming off the sideline. And generally, that they, the, the feeling in the market is very, very positive right now. And we're trying to get as much land as we can to sell. And what, what are breaking into sections like what are the three factors impacting pricing and activity right now like pushing pricing well, they, up or down yeah well well generally you you look at at the end end use market if you look at the the five main food groups for land you have residential rental residential condo hotel office and then miscellaneous where you have uh health education um things like that user groups that will build buildings for their own occupancy but what's really driving value for any land, you, you have to look at the possession of the site. Can it be delivered vacant? You need to have a massing study done. We just sold a site where uh, the owners were reluctant to do a, a massing study. This was a, a, a site worth nearly $100 million. The seller didn't want to spend mm -hmm. uh, five or 10 grand on a massing study. I'll never do that again as a broker. I will always make sure we have a massing study done because it created problems with the execution, but you also need to look at what the environmental condition of the property is, look at expansion possibilities. Um, you know, these are things that will, will impact uh, what the value of a site is, what bonus programs are available, can you take advantage of inclusionary housing bonuses, uh, are there available air rights from adjacent parcels, there are a number of things to look at to determine what a site is worth, because I've always said land is worth what the entire site on a blended basis is worth. What the as of right is worth versus the bonus programs in Hudson Yards, for instance, <clears throat> you have uh, Eastern Rail Yards rights, you have district improvement bonus rights, and all the developer really cares about is what is the total cost for the total amount of buildable footage I have. They don't really care about what's being paid for each component part, as I think Jeremy would uh, would advocate for. It's about the blend, what the total price is. So all of those things are taken into consideration when we're looking at what the value of a piece of land is. And uh, to Jeremy, I wanna ask, can you talk about specific areas you're looking in the city right now as a, as a buyer? Yeah. I mean, I can talk about areas that I'm very keen on developing. Um, let's say on the multifamily side, I'd love to be able to expand our, 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 our platform further into Brooklyn. We have four buildings in Brooklyn, and two in various stages of construction. The rest are existing and operating, but we, we like Brooklyn. I like, uh, we like Greenpoint. We like Williamsburg. We, we, we we're keen on Prospect Heights and uh, Fort Greene and, and, and Gowanus. That all said, and, and and by the way, uh, under normal circumstances, we'd be going further out into Brooklyn and specking on land, uh, anticipating that over a long period of time we can work we can work entitlements and 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 plan uh, do some master planning. Uh, but in this environment, with the political opposition, the uncertainty around 421A, it, it is very difficult for us to actually deploy capital into those markets right now. Has the environment in the city changed with the with the uh, administration's change, like in terms of entitlements? I guess my response on that is that, that it's a little too early to tell. I mean, the they're still assembling the teams and 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 but but I would say both at this city and state level at the tops of these, uh, meaning the governor and the mayor are certainly saying the right things. Uh, we're, we're supporters of both. We think they put um, the right people in the right positions, specifically at city planning, very 
pleased to see the direction that's going. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're putting smart people into uh, deputy mayor positions and at agencies. And so like, it seems uh, what they're saying in the body language is that they are, they actually value economic growth and they want to put New York uh, City and New York State on sound financial footing. So that's great. And now we actually have to put it into motion and we have to put, you know, have to, you know, make sure the programs are there so that people like us can develop and grow the economy and grow the housing stock. Yeah, and I, to tag, tag on to that, Adam, I think to, what, what Jeremy's saying is that to the extent the incentives are, are correct, the private sector will do anything you want it to do. Uh, whether it's creating affordable housing, workforce housing, building more of this or that, create the right incentives. The, the, the private sector development market in New York has tremendous dexterity and uh, will, will do what you encourage them or in, incentivize them to do. And I think so far the administration certainly has a different perspective on uh, the development process um, for in New York. And I think the realization that over 50% of the revenue uh, for the city comes from real estate, either directly or tangentially, is not lost on the governor and the mayor. And uh, you know, regardless of, of what you want to do, um, you, you want to well, what you want to do as a politician with resources. You have to have the resources in order to do the stuff you want to do. And a thriving real estate industry will provide more resources for politicians to do more with. And uh, Bob, on a turning back again, I don't want to get too bogged down in 421A, but or or other elements. But when you're talking to try to get someone to sell land, I mean, what are the top issues that they tell you that they're not going to? I don't want to obsess on 421A. Like, what are their other other reasons? No, look, the, well, uh, effectively, because of the uncertainty of 421A, if any seller has a piece of land that is suitable for uh, rental construction, and this is mostly in the outer boroughs. Um, if the owner has not proactively done anything to get a footing in the ground uh, by June of this year, that, that site is frozen. Uh, we're, we're advocating for people not to even put those sites on the market because they're not going to get good traction. Um, but clearly the thing that is the number one reason why owners of land decide to sell or ground lease land, and we shouldn't overlook ground leasing uh, mm -hmm. because that's become much more prevalent these days, but the thing that induces them to do that is the value of their property. That's why you often see when an area is rezoned, you very frequently will see a lot of sales in that area because all of a sudden the value has gone up. That induces people who may have been holders for the long term to put those sites on the market. Those sites become new buildings. That creates jobs. That creates tax revenue. That's a great thing for the city. So I think the, the number one thing people look at is what's the value. And that's why, conversely, when you have values falling, uh, because of the pandemic or for any a variety of reasons, you see a lack of trading because sellers don't sell for less today uh, than they could have gotten yesterday, generally. There, in terms of trying to get someone to, trying to get someone to sell their property right now, um, with the, the, the challenge, the sort of the uncertain about 421A, do you have people that will look to some of the other products in terms of like yeah, sell it? To sell a piece of land and buy an income producing property? Or to sell, uh, if, if, it's, if there's uncertainty, if they think they're not going to get a great number or through the rental development um, to try to convince them that maybe they can sell it under another um, sort of pitching in it is a different type of product, a different type of development. For a hotel development or yeah, office or development or something yeah. like that, affordable housing, um, assisted living. There, there are a number of different things. When we talk to a seller about their land, we look at the value from a number of different perspectives. And clearly the seller will want to sell at what the highest and best use of that land is. Um, but I also think it's, it's very um, challenging to try to encourage someone to sell who doesn't have a specific reason to want to sell. You know, clearly we love the reasons, death, divorce, taxes, partnership disputes when, when folks have to sell. Um, but discretionary sales really are a function of, you know, how much somebody can get for their property today um, and how much 
uh, and what they can do with those proceeds or what they want to do with those proceeds. Sometimes that's a lifestyle decision where maybe they want to sell a property and go buy a big yacht and uh, change their lifestyle or, you know, maybe they want to invest in a different location and different type of property. Um, those are all reasons for sales. But, you know, especially today, uh, there are financing vehicles that we have that uh, when someone does a ground lease, they can finance that fee position for almost as much as they could get by selling the property. So effectively, you can sell the property three times. And this is talking about 30, 35 year fixed rate financing. You can sell the property three times within 99 years and at the end of 99 years still own your property. So there are a number of options today based upon how the capital markets are working for owners of land. And uh, uh, Jeremy, talking about financing, but not, uh, not 199 years, but what are some of the what are the top issues affecting that right now in terms of construction and then in terms of uh, cash flowing? Yeah, I mean, look, I think today and we're meaning the last couple of weeks, we've seen a lot of volatility in that market uh, just because of what's happening around the world uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and you know, so we were, we were in the market actually trying to finance uh, a, an acquisition that we were making uh, a building in Brooklyn. Um, and thought we were all teed up, ready to go. And then two weeks ago, the market sort of went sideways on us. People started pulling their term sheets back. But ultimately, uh, with some massaging and, you know, and, and, and slight tweaks to the deal terms, we ultimately got that uh, over the finish line. So that was, you know, positive. But, you know, that's cur currently, you know, a, there's a lot of uncertainty in the financing markets, it seems. Um, I think maybe this is a response to your question, but there are a couple things that, you know, not only do we as developers and equity investors think about, but I think lending sources think about it is again, going back to regulatory pressure that's coming at us uh, and, and sort of when somebody is making a construction loan or even when making a perm loan and looking at their takeout, having to worry about um, uh, regulation being thrown at the industry, the unforeseen type regulations. For example, good cause eviction is sort of, it is something people talk a lot about proposed propose at the at the state level in, in a very very left-wing type way um i don't think that is that specific bill is going anywhere but ultimately if that gets put on a uh, layer on top of multifamily housing i mean that's a very challenging thing to have to develop uh around and also for a, for a lender who never had to expect that to be uh uh, levying on a project um, to sort of accept. And sort of with that kind of uncertainty, it's hard for lenders and investors to sort of have a lot of confidence that New York uh, City and New York State it has a stable uh, legisla legis legislature and, and that, that, that regulations aren't going to come at them un unforeseen. The, in terms of handling all that, that risk, are there different types of lenders that that are uh, more insured against that or something? Do you see? I don't like think anyone's protected. Or... I don't think anyone's protected necessarily. It sort of, it tr probably translates to higher cost in some ways or lower leverage. Um, uh, but it, but it, hard to say exactly, but I don't think anyone, no one's protected from this. I mean, we saw it in 2019 when the, when the laws changed and there was a massive diminution of value on the properties. Lenders who had exposure to those properties all of a sudden were looking at different LTVs. Many of them were upside down. Uh, you, you impose good cause eviction. How do we grow rents to take out a construction loan, right? That, 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 that imposes risk on the construction lender. And, you know, I think, and that's just, you know, that's just you know, a couple examples. I mean, like, like, I'll give you one more example, if you'd like. The housing, the, uh, the 2019 rent laws, when they change, we have a lot of office, a lot of residential buildings that are market rate buildings that we've been running as rentals. And we, with a, with a, sort of an acceptable yield, knowing that at the end of the day, there was an opportunity to convert those to condominiums by us or by a next buyer. It could have been 10 years from now, it could be 20 years, 30, 50 years down the line. But we always have that value embedded in the asset. When the rent laws changed, they, it, they essentially made it impossible for us to unlock that value by requiring that we have to sell 51% of the bill of the units to insiders, to current residents, which it's essentially impossible. So how do I say to a lender, don't, you know, look at the cash flow as a rental, understand the loan to value from that perspective, but know that there's embedded value there that's further protecting you. 
right? I can't make that claim anymore because the, because legislation was thrown at us that sort of basically diminished our value. So I, I, these are things that like, I think we, I know we think about, I'm certain our lenders are thinking about it. And I think that to tag mm -hmm. on to it, because I think it's such an important point. If you look at how policy is so highly correlated to the way the markets function, it's interesting. If you look at, at cities nationwide and you look at in 2021, the cities that were, were seeing highest sales volume, uh, most economic activity, increases in population. And you know, if any of you read the stuff that I write, uh, I consider myself a real estate-arian, not a Republican or a Democrat. So I'm just coming completely from the real estate perspective. Every city that is trending positively in terms of sales volumes and economic activity and population growth, they're all in red states. Uh, and New the York cities that are, are coming back on the downslope, including New York, are in blue states. But and this rents fact came back, too, but rents, pardon? everyone said rents came back in New York. Everyone said, rents came back. no, absolutely, Adam. But what I'm saying is that all of these things, like to Jeremy's point about how, you know, the inability to convert buildings, this is a, a random policy decision to stop people from converting mm -hmm. a building, selling 15%, getting the plan effective, and then having a free market building. That is driving capital away from New York. So New York for... I started here in 84. From 84 to 2019, New York was the number one city in the United States for sales volume. Uh, in 2020, it was number three. In 2021, it was number seven. Dallas was number one. Uh, these, these are real things. The policy decisions are impacting the way markets function. And we're, we're hopeful that the, the new administrations um, understand the importance of real estate to a booming New York to create jobs and to create more revenue so that different initiatives can be undertaken. But we need jobs, we need tax revenue, and through real estate is the easiest way to get both of them. Well, I want to thank you. If you guys have any, do you have any predictions you dare make in the next uh, week, either or month or whatever, sort of how things are going to shake out is 421A or just any of the other issues facing the industry? I, I, I guess my prediction is that 421A ultimately doesn't pass. And we, like I said earlier, we have a, a period of time in the pipeline forward that we sort of see a very limited uh, housing production, which is going to only exacerbate the housing crisis that we have today. Jeremy, I, I hope your prediction does not come true. Um, <laughs> no disrespect <laughs> intended. Um, I, I, I would say, Adam, that if you look at the correction that we just went through, I think New York City investment sales market has been in correction for about five and a half years. Uh, from uh, October of 2015 uh, through the fourth quarter of, of 2021. Uh, I think the market is poised for a tremendous run. Uh, and the only caveat being an externality that could impact the market. Tax policy is very highly correlated to, um, uh, to how the market functions. And interest rates are something everybody has to be keeping a, a close eye on. Um, but uh, absent those two issues, I think we could see a five or six run in the investment sales market here, and I hope that happens. All right. Well, we'll be watching. Um, I appreciate it. Thanks so much to Jeremy Schell and Bob Knackle and, um, and for everyone for tuning in. Thanks so much.